An historic building in a small Connecticut town is torched by fire. Investigators know there's more to this case than arson when a key witness turns up dead. I receive an urgent call. Get to the scene as soon as possible. Forensic expert Dr. Henry Lee finds himself in a town where no one wants to talk. But can this renowned criminalist reconstruct the forensic trail and uncover new evidence that will put a killer behind bars? Residents of Salisbury, Connecticut were devastated when their historic town hall was gutted by arson. Police had a suspect, a local man named Roy Dunce, and a witness who'd seen Dunce set the fire, Earl Morey. It looked like an open and shut case until Earl Morey was found murdered before he could testify. Investigators urgently called forensic expert Dr. Henry Lee to the crime scene before an approaching storm washed away evidence. At the original crime scene, three spent shell casings were recovered near the body, and two bullets were found underneath it. Yet Maury had been shot three times. What happened to the third bullet? According to Dr. Lee, the first shot struck Maury in the head. The small amount of blood on the victim's pants and none on his sneakers suggested that he fell to the ground immediately and was shot two more times as he lay there. To Dr. Lee, the crime scene felt organized, calculated. Uh, and organizing usually planned it well, that's an execution. Near the body, Lee also found two sets of overlapping tire tracks. By interpreting them correctly, he got a better sense of what happened at Long Pond that night. It turned out the larger set of tracks matched the tires on a tow truck that had pulled a car from the pond the previous night. The other tracks were consistent with the tires on the car Earl Morey was driving before he was shot. Dr. Lee thought a couple of shoe prints near the victim's body might provide an answer. Back in the lab, criminalists discovered there was only one sneaker with this unusual hexagonal pattern on its sole, a model manufactured by the Korean company FootJoy. Detectives now knew the type of shoes the killer was wearing, but they still wanted to find the weapon he used. Police divers had searched Long Pond for the gun and found nothing, but Dr. Lee could still learn a lot about the murder weapon by examining the bullets found at the scene. If the police ever found a 9mm Smith & Wesson, they'd be able to match it to the bullets that killed Earl Morey. But all they knew at this point is that when Morey made his confession about the arson case, he was frightened. With so little evidence at the crime scene, Dr. Henry Lee began to reconstruct what happened on the night of the murder with the help of criminalist Ed Jakimowicz. First, they wanted to examine the pattern of residue on targets from a similar gun fired at different distances. Robert O'Brien, supervising criminalist, used a simple household appliance to enhance the gunshot residue pattern deposited on the targets. Dr. Lee then compared them to the residue found on the victim's wounds and shirt. Dr. Lee determined that Earl Morey fell to the ground after being shot in the head at close range. The murderer then fired a second shot from about 42 inches away. The amount of the gunshot residue on the victim's shirt indicated that the killer moved in closer for the third and final shot. Investigators were convinced Morey was killed to stop him from testifying at the arson trial of Roy Dunce. In fact, Morey was so afraid of making a statement that he pleaded with detectives to rough him up so it would look like he had been coerced. And Earl Morey was sure Richie Dunce was mad at him for fingering Richie's younger brother Roy as the man who burned down the town hall. When investigators searched Earl Morey's clothing, they found a small packet containing a white powder. Investigators believed they had found an important piece of evidence. It suggested that Earl Morey had gone to Long Pond to score some cocaine from Richard Dunce. But laboratory analysis of the white powder revealed that it was just crushed aspirin. Dr. Lee hoped he'd have more luck linking Richard Dunce to the murder when he examined Earl Morey's car and noticed a blood smear on the car's rear fender. The blood on the car was identified as Earl Morey's, which indicated that Earl's car had been at the pond when he was killed. But how did it end up 10 miles from the crime scene? Lee found several blue nylon fibers embedded in the sole of one of Earl Morey's sneakers, and they were consistent with the fibers in the carpet of Richard Dunce's van. 
but it was Richard Dunce's van that provided the most promising evidence. When they searched the suspect's van, they found this light bulb. The loose bulb was identical to one missing from a light fixture in the roof of Earl Morey's car. Did Richard Dunce remove it the night of the murder? Dr. Lee compared the light fixture in Maury's car to the markings on the light bulb found in Richard Dunce's van. They matched, but that wasn't all investigators found in the van. In the back, there was a fishing vest with a familiar pattern on it. That particular pattern we enhanced with an electrostatic lifting device method. And that is nothing more than a method where we, we just lift off the dust residues associated with the footwear from the vest onto a transfer film. Dr. Lee had seen these shoe impressions before. They exhibited the same hexagonal pattern as the shoe prints he found next to Earl Morey's body at the crime scene. Detectives hadn't found any Foot Joy sneakers when they searched Richard Dunce's apartment, but they did find the next best thing, a photo of Dunce wearing the model of Foot Joys in question. What happened that night at Long Pond was becoming clearer, but there still wasn't enough evidence to convict Richard Dunce of murder. Then police got some help from an unexpected source, the third Dunce brother, Ronnie. Ronnie told the police that he bought a stolen 9mm Smith & Wesson and then sold it to his older brother. So we went back to the original owner and naturally we asked him, do you have any shell casings? He told me you, the original the gun owner took yeah. Detective Carey to him. a woods in New York State where he used to target practice. It wasn't long before detectives found more than a dozen casings lying on the ground in plain sight. They also discovered a number of scars on the bark of the tree and managed to dig out nine bullets. The bullets and the casings were sent to the forensic lab where Dr. Lee compared their markings to the ones found at the crime scene. Here shows the firing pin impression, the bridge bar face striking and shows a continuous flow from one casing to another. Although the weapon never recovered, but we do know it's fired from the same type of weapon. Even though police could now put the murder weapon in Richard Dunce's hands, it didn't prove he was the one who pulled the trigger. Witnesses who had heard him threaten to kill Earl Morey started to come forward. More than three years after Earl Morey was found shot to death, Richard Dunst was charged with his murder. We have to put this puzzle together in a systematic fashion to present to the jury. Although we don't have every pieces, but we have sufficient pieces to show Richard Dunst, in fact, involved in this case.